Rock bands straying from the genre that made them famous often leads to severe fan backlash, from cringe-inducing dubstep crossovers to glam bands trying to be grunge. Today, we're going to explore some of the most controversial genre switches in rock music. By the end of the video, we'll uncover how a band's shift to pop unintentionally led to the tragic demise of their lead vocalist. But first, we need to talk about Metallica, who have antagonized their legions of fans with multiple genre switches throughout their storied career. The band's first big shift came in 1991, when they left thrash metal behind in favor of a more refined hard rock sound with the release of the Black Album. This album sucks. Sad but true. I bought this when it came out. I was horrified when I listened to it. I threw it off a bridge and watched a truck smash it. Despite being met with accusations of selling out by their core fan base, the album was an unprecedented commercial success and turned Metallica into a household name. However, the band further stirred controversy among fans with their subsequent albums, Load and Reload, featuring a new image characterized by tidy haircuts, eyeliner, and a shift to a sterilized, radio-friendly sound. Released in 1996 and 1997 respectively, both albums have gone down in history among the most reviled work of the group's career, with Vice Media lambasting them as, quote, self-indulgent dad rock. Nevertheless, Metallica experienced the most severe backlash of their career when their universally hated album, Saint Anger, hit shelves in 2003. Mimicking many of the trends popularized by new metal at the turn of the millennium, Saint Anger would see the band tuning their instruments lower than ever, muddying their production, and even abandoning the guitar solos that made them legends. Drummer Lars Ulrich was especially criticized, particularly for his decision to unhook his snare drum, so it sounds like he's banging on a tin can throughout the entire album. Black album, fame, fortune, right? Same anger, despair, misery, loss of revenue, no album sold, you know, that's it right there. The overprocessed guitars, excruciating song lengths, and sheer absence of Metallica's core sound all resulted in negative reviews from fans and critics alike. As a result of the overwhelming hate for the album, the band would focus the marketing for their follow-up release, Death Magnetic, around the promise that the group was finally returning to their thrash metal roots. But Metallica wasn't the only thrash band to fail at a genre switch, as their rivals in Megadeth would face a similar misstep when attempting to break through on alternative rock radio with their 1999 album, Risk. Because Metallica did it, they crossed over to alternative, Soundgarden did it, they crossed over to alternative. Inspired by guitarist Marty Friedman's desire to indulge in his pop sensibilities, Risk was virtually devoid of metal, and would alienate hardcore Megadeth fans due to its departure from the technically complex guitar work the band was known for. The album would, instead, lean into a more commercial sound that critics dubbed corporate mock rock. No song exemplifies Risk's shameless pandering more than its lead single, Crush Em, which was blatantly manufactured with the hopes of becoming a new sports anthem for the NFL. Even Megadeth frontman Dave Mustaine would come to admit that the track was the dumbest song in the band's entire discography. The album was ultimately a critical and commercial failure, forcing the group to retreat back to a more familiar sound on their next release. Yet perhaps no thrash band hopped on a fad more shamelessly than Slayer. Despite being hailed as one of the big four of the thrash metal genre, the group would forsake their fast and aggressive musical style to align with the emerging new metal scene of the late 90s. Released in 1998, the album Diabolus in Musica was Slayer's knee-jerk reaction to the hottest trend in heavy music at that time, drawing criticism for adopting downtuned guitars, murky chord structures, and churning beats. Unfortunately for Slayer, not only did the album estrange their core fan base, but it also failed to impress the new metal crowd. Even Slayer guitarist Kerry King has expressed regret for the musical direction of Diabolus in Musica. That's the one record that I really paid 
not enough attention to because I was really bitter about what kind of music was popular. That's probably my least favorite record of our history. King went as far as comparing Diabolus and Musica to Judas Priest's infamously divisive album Turbo. And speaking of Turbo, even Judas Priest themselves have acknowledged the shortcomings of their 1986 album. This era of Priest's legacy would see the group take on a commercial glam metal sound, substituting heavy riffs and solos with synthesizers. But we knew that there were always people on the outer fringes, you know, looking in and saying, well, I like Priest, but maybe, you know, I'm not sure about this or I'm not sure about that. I think to reach out and, and, and bring those people in, we, we had to, uh, we adapted somewhat, you know. Not only that, but they also traded in their signature all-black spiked leather attire for a more colorful and glitzy wardrobe. Even the album's lyrical themes departed from the band's typical sci-fi and fantasy concepts, focusing more on introspective topics such as love and romance. In his 2020 memoir, Confess, Judas Priest frontman Rob Halford admitted that he now sees his lyrics on Turbo as subpar, stating that his alcohol and substance abuse at the time had started to take their toll on his writing process. Halford has further dubbed Turbo as the love-hate Judas Priest album. Judas Priest would return to form a few years later, shedding the glam metal facade for their next album, Painkiller. However, when it comes to glam metal, perhaps no band had a bigger fall than Los Angeles' own Motley Crue. Despite being one of the biggest bands of the 80s, the band found themselves languishing in irrelevancy following the rise of grunge in the following decade. In a last-ditch effort to revive their faltering career, the band decided to embrace a grungier sound on their sixth studio album. This shift led to disagreements between singer Vince Neil and his bandmates, culminating in his departure from the group in the middle of recording sessions. When asked about the split by the press, Neil expressed his concern that his former band's new direction would alienate longtime fans. The way the music was going for, uh, for the new Motley Crue album was really going too far away from from the stuff that we'd uh you know the fans have grown up grown up and grown to love and um anytime i expressed my my disappointment with the music i was like the odd man out you know and uh so i really wasn't that excited about about the the new tunes his concerns were justified when Motley Crue's self-titled 1994 album, featuring new vocalist John Karabi, fell short in sales compared to the band's earlier releases. Their subsequent tour would only serve to further humiliate the band, as the crew was forced to downgrade from stadiums and arenas to theaters and clubs before eventually canceling the tour altogether due to poor ticket sales. For the next few years, label executives would repeatedly pressure the band band to reunite with Vince Neil, who would eventually rejoin to Motley Crue in 1997. The making of the band's reunion album, however, would prove to be an absolute disaster, with Neil quitting the band multiple times during recording sessions. Making matters worse, Motley Crue's new producer, Scott Humphrey, would regularly bicker with bassist Nikki Six over the album's direction. The producer would even push the crew's legendary guitarist, Mick Mars, out of the studio, re-recording his guitar parts without his knowledge. It's still still eats at me it still it still does when i'm recording a new record and everything else i still have that self-doubt from that that was that album me up the final product, titled Generation Swine, marked yet another genre shift for the band, this time stumbling into the realm of alternative rock. Featuring glitchy guitar effects and electronic ambient sounds, the album was declared a downright embarrassment by critics. Even Mick Mars has publicly distanced himself from the album, lamenting his band's attempts to incorporate synthesizers into their music. However, this next band's use of synthesizers would produce the most excruciatingly cringe-inducing results. In 2011, new metal pioneers Korn would attempt to cash in on that decade's dubstep craze with the release of their
their EDM crossover album, The Path of Totality. Leading up to the album's launch, Korn frontman Jonathan Davis exuded great confidence in the songs, hailing them as the future of metal. Despite Davis's optimism, the album was panned by both critics and fans alike. In one particularly scathing review, Sputnik Music would state, The Path of Totality is a truly horrible album, built on a foundation of tired and overwrought stereotypes put together not by just a clueless band, but a bunch of equally confused artists who truly have no proper understanding of the genre they claim to be a part of. Predictably, Korn's misguided venture into dubstep has not aged well, with the album now serving as a reminder of the corporate gold rush spurred by dubstep's rise. Which brings to mind Guns N' Roses frontman Axl Rose, who similarly became fixated with electronic music in the mid-90s, with this obsession ultimately leading to the complete disintegration of his band. When GNR began working on their sixth album in 1994, it became quickly apparent that Axel's fascination with electronica and industrial rock would become a problem. His bandmates quickly voiced their disapproval over his attempts to push the group towards those genres, and one by one would exit the group, until by 1998, Rose was the sole original member left in Guns N' Roses. The singer would soldier on by way of hiring an all-new lineup of GNR, GNR, even managing to recruit multiple members of his favorite industrial rock band, Nine Inch Nails. Famed electronic musician Moby was later enlisted to produce, though he would eventually drop out of the project, with countless other musicians following suit across its 14-year development. In total, Guns N' Roses would burn through $14 million, record in 15 different studios, and go through 17 lineup changes in hopes of finishing these songs. By the time the album, titled Chinese Democracy, was finally released on November 23, 2008, the electronic synths and trip-hop beats that Rose was so fond of were utterly antiquated, eliciting a universally negative response. With sales figures that greatly undersold industry expectations, the album was deemed a commercial failure and found its way on several publications' worst of the year lists. Despite this, critics today look back on Chinese democracy fondly, unlike Queen's own 2008 album, The Cosmos Rocks, wherein the legendary group would try and fail to move forward after the death of their iconic frontman, Freddie Mercury. Following a successful reunion tour fronted by Bad Company singer Paul Rogers, Queen ventured into the studio in 2006 to create their first album in over a decade. However, the resulting music sounded more like a Paul Rogers solo album with Queen as mere guest musicians, and the band's reinvention was not well received by the public. The lyrics were denounced by critics for being stupid, trite, and a bit offensive, and the band's label, EMI, would do little to promote the album. Queen drummer Roger Taylor would eventually admit that Paul Rogers was not a good fit for the band, with guitarist Brian May lamenting the fact that the Cosmos Rocks failed to make even the slightest dent on the public consciousness. This next album, however, would go down in history for all the wrong reasons. Despite spearheading the punk rock revival movement, LA-based punk band Bad Religion would make the baffling decision to restyle themselves as an avant-garde prog band on their second studio album. During their 1982 tour in support of their debut album, the members of Bad Religion observed what they perceived to be a downturn in Southern California's punk rock scene. Now under the impression that punk was dead, the group chose to evolve beyond the genre for their their sophomore album. The band's subsequent recording sessions were reportedly tense and sometimes disastrous. Bassist Jay Bentley was so outraged with vocalist Greg Graffin's heavy use of synthesizers that he abruptly quit the band in the middle of recording the session's first track. The resulting album, titled Into the Unknown, featured slower tempos, use of electronic organs and pianos, and a prog-influenced hard rock sound rather than the punk stylings that fans came to love them for. 
When Bad Religion debuted the new material live, only 12 attendees showed up for the concert as fans discovered that the band planned to incorporate keyboards into their show. Into the Unknown proved to be the band's most controversial release of their career, labeled as an utter commercial failure, and even resulting in the disbandment of Bad Religion. The group, however, would ultimately reform in 1985, with guitarist Brett Gurowitz looking back on the album as a terrible misstep. Much like the guitarist from the next band on this list, Aerosmith's Joe Perry, who would call his band's 2001 album his least favorite in their discography. For context, it's important to note that the new millennium saw Aerosmith gain a newfound popularity among younger audiences, particularly thanks to the band's highly acclaimed Super Bowl halftime show performance alongside contemporary powerhouses such as NSYNC and Britney Spears. Spears. Determined to capitalize on their mainstream resurgence, the band focused their musical efforts on writing a pop rock album for the masses by way of just push play. And while the album's first single, Jaded, easily made its way to the top of the charts due to its placement in the halftime show, the album was met with scorn from longtime fans and critics today still consider it one of the worst in Aerosmith's career. Just Push Play was particularly criticized for noticeably abandoning the band's musical roots, with Aerosmith incorporating more contemporary elements into their songs such as pop song structures, and even frequent rap verses from frontman Steven Tyler. A review from Hardwired Magazine would mock the album as a midlife crisis, and All Music would state that the band's refusal to act their age results in a couple of embarrassing slips into stodginess. And while Aerosmith survived their attempt to go mainstream, the final band on this list was not so lucky, as harsh backlash from fans inadvertently contributed to an unfathomable tragedy. In February of 2017, alternative metal band Linkin Park released the first single from their upcoming studio album, One More Light. The track, titled Heavy, was a jarring departure from the band's signature sound, and fans viciously rejected the shift to straight-up pop. Up. In response to the single's negative reception, frontman Chester Bennington would lash out, telling fans to stab themselves in the face if they didn't like the song, and even threatening to kill anyone who accused him of selling out. The singer would later double down on his statements during an interview with Kerrang! Radio, stating, If you're gonna say they made a marketing decision to make this kind of record to make money, you can meet me outside and I will punch you in your f mouth. When One More Light was finally released a few months later, critics absolutely tore it apart, calling the album a corny and contrived attempt at capitalizing on the trend of dance music-fueled pop. However, unbeknownst to both fans and critics, Chester Bennington was struggling, badly. The singer had been battling depression and substance issues for most of his life, and the then-recent of his close friend, Soundgarden's Chris Cornell, had put him in a very dark place. So on July 20th, 2017, the date that would have been Cornell's 53rd birthday, Bennington did the unthinkable, and tragically ended it all, with Linkin Park going on hiatus ever since. This is the last photo ever taken of Chester Bennington, whose heartbreaking death now serves as a sobering reminder that everyone you meet is fighting a battle you know nothing about.